Good morning. I am Luffy Me talking to JT Ellison, who is writing with a co-author whose name is Alicia, and I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. Klipik. Alicia Klipik. Thank you. Uh, and they are writing together as Josh Walker. And I have, lucky me, I have a copy of this fabulous book called Tomb of the Queen. Book one, Jane Thorne, CIA Librarian. <laughs> I've got to say that this is a really cool concept, especially for somebody who is a librarian, you know, before I was a bookstore owner and other stuff, I was a librarian at the Library of Congress and four of our staff, wait, Susan, John, maybe five, um, are librarians, you know, retired you or part-time. So this book is bound to resonate with them. Um, and when I was earning my master's in library science, which is what it was called then, and now it's information science or whatever it was, I actually did a research project at Vanderbilt University. So you can imagine I cracked up when I realized that Jane, when we meet her here in this book, is a librarian at Vanderbilt University. So why'd you pick Vanderbilt? Because it's near where you live? Yes. <laughs> it's... Um... With something like that, when we've got two of us who aren't librarians, we needed something that was local enough that we could do the research. And Alicia was able to go and get into the vault and do all of the amazing things one on one with the library. And it just it just seemed like the best jumping off point for the story. It's someplace, you know, someplace familiar. Anytime you have a fantasy novel, you want to ground an urban fantasy, you want to ground it in a reality that people can understand and, and is accessible. And that's that's what we chose. And it it is it's very fun to just to have a librarian from from Nashville, right? I think it's wonderful. And actually, Vanderbilt has a very sophisticated life. Sorry, I'm moving my computer thing around here because I want to lean back in my chair without breaking my neck. Um, <laughs> I think Vanderbilt has a very, a very good library. The campus is beautiful. Um, yeah. And I love the idea of her having a magical experience in the library vault, which is not a place where you would normally expect this sort of thing to happen. Yeah. No, not at all. And that's, you know, that that's how the story opens. She is in the vault. Jane is doing um, one last minute thing before she shuts down for the day to prep for the next day's work because she's that kind of girl, right? She works ahead. She always is very responsible, does all of her things. She's a very typical librarian. She's just a young one, just new to the field. But she uh, is, is prepping her work for the next day. She touches a manuscript and starts seeing stars. And she has ocular migraines and she just assumes that's what it is. She takes a pill, she goes out to dinner with her sister, comes back to work the next day and it happens again. And this time she realizes something else is going on because when she comes back to herself, there is a very large black man standing in the vault saying, hello, Jane, I'm from the CIA. We would like to talk to you. <laughs> I love the whole recruiting thing. So by the time we're on page 37 of this book, here's Jane and her experience. She had seen stars and a river of light. A man had appeared. He'd offer her, offered her a job with the CIA, then disappeared into a hedge. Four bizarre happenings in less than an hour. They had to be connected somehow, which I think, you know, brilliantly sums up her experience. Now, I have to say um, that that part of this reminds me of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell in the sense that, you know, magic has been, um, what pushed out of the world, it's um, it's on the margins, um, but it's out there and maybe it's creeping back in. And so the CIA is what, throwing up a line of defense? What is the CIA's position regarding magic? So magic has been throttled by a, a, a curse, by a, a master that is a master level magician and they haven't seen one in decades, centuries probably. And magic has, is then it's stuck in this tiny river of stars and only incredibly talented magicians can access it. The CIA, obviously, it, their division, the torrent control organization can do it, but it takes a lot of effort for them. They're, the other side though, of course, there's gotta be a bad side, right? And there is a terror organization called the Kingdom. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> we just had a blue alert. Um, I don't know what a blue alert is, but we'll see what that is. Um, 
there was a incident here last night, so that might be something to do with that. Anyway, so the, the bad guys, right, the kingdom, are trying to turn magic off for the rest of the world and only have a magical population that they control. And that, that scares me, right? The idea of anybody controlling another group through a means that, that other people don't have access to. Well, that's so and Harry Potter. I mean, that's really like muggles, um, whatever. I mean, I noticed that you throw all, <clears throat> excuse me, you throw references to all kinds of other wonderful magic. We have Robin Hobbs, we have Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. I'm sure somewhere in this, I haven't gotten far enough yet. <clears throat> excuse me, that J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter will come along. Oh, but sure. I mean, I, it's a lovely concept that, you know, somehow out there is, is magic and it's either going to be beneficent or it's going to be malevolent. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole control issue going on. Um, I'm actually talking to an author named Sebastian who's rewritten The Lady of the Lake, the Tennyson poem, but the whole Arthurian legend. And in, in the parlance of today, she's going to give the lady agency. I might tell you agency <laughs> is my second least favorite word now after pivot. Uh, but nonetheless, um, that's part of the point. And, and in the book, she argues that Morgan Le Fay and her sister and so forth, that it's about um, the Fay world and then the real world of Arthur and the borders between them. And, you know, is the lady, she's kind of moving across the borders or she has to figure out the borders. So I think, I think in fantasy fiction, there's, um, that's a continuing theme, right? That, you know. Sure stuff that exists so you know there's a lot of medieval fantasy i mean because you know the whole medieval world lends itself fabulously um and and then but i really like this idea of a contemporary fantasy and of course i love the idea of a librarian so you know one of the wonderful questions that you sent me in advance we could discuss this is so much fun it's like finding a book club i love it <laughs> um, she did all the work i just asked the questions but why not um, how did you come up with the idea of a CIA library? And we've touched on it, but you want to expand that a bit? Sure. So uh, back in 2016, I saw a, uh, a tweet that the CIA was hiring a librarian. And it was one of those just instant, oh, wouldn't that be fun? Jane Bond, CIA librarian. I mean, it just, just immediately came to me and I sent it to my husband and my assistant. I said, has anybody done this? And it turns out they, they hadn't done it in our kind of genre and fictional world. So I started down the path of doing it as a, a straight contemporary thriller that she was a CIA librarian, right? Who was a spy. And that didn't get Lex. It just, it, it just wasn't working. I had too many other projects to give it my all my energy and it needed all of my energy. But I wanted something that was gonna be lighter, not as dark as what I normally do, something that was funnier, that, that there'd be a little more freedom in it. And that's when I hosted a, a brunch at my house and Alicia came over as part of the group of writers in Nashville who, who we kind of float around to each other's houses and do these things, so it was my turn. Everybody else is in the kitchen. She comes in, she parks herself on the couch, puts on her headphones, bangs out 2000, and then comes and joins the fun. And I went, what if I did it with a co-writer? And hmm, Alicia writes fantasy. What if Jane had magic? Boom. And, that, and that, that was the entry point. I sat down with her. This was in 2018. So I sat down with her and said, would you be interested in doing this? And she said, yeah, this sounds like a lot of fun. And I was co-writing with Catherine at the time. And so I learned a lot about co-writing relationships and how they can be structured and what was working with us and what wasn't working with us. And so I tried to apply that to what we were doing. And of course, every relationship is different. <laughs> That's just how it works. Um, but Alicia is, she's brilliant. She writes, she writes fantasy. Her day job is actually teaching martial arts. So all of Jane's fight background, she's a kickboxer and a martial artist and everything. That's legit. That all comes from, from Alicia's experience with that. And it was really neat having somebody who was in town, we could go and have lunch and sit down and kind of bang all of this around. I wanted something that was Gilmore Girls meets Alias with Matt. 
<laughs> and that's that's really what this is, right? It's it's definitely, you know, if Jane was Rory, just the smart aleck, super smart, super engaging, funny, witty, but brave and courageous and kind person who accidentally throws herself into a magical world and out that she has ties to this world that she knew nothing about. It's my favorite kind of story, a girl or a woman who is faced with great change who must rise up and be a leader. And that's my favorite, favorite kind of story. And that's exactly what we did with this. And I just, it's fun. I like it. <laughs> I can tell you like it. And of course, the idea of the ordinary person, you know, rising to extraordinary things is, you know, is an age old storytelling device yeah, and it goes all the way to the Odyssey and the Iliad and, and so forth. And also, I mean, your experience co-writing with Catherine Coulter, with whom, by the way, I'm doing her launch in uh, in early August and I had the- Oh, for Vortex. Of, yep, and I had the Yay. pleasure of doing that last year too. And we spoke a little bit about, you know, your collaboration with her, but I think, you know, I think once you've done it, it would obviously be easier, easier to conceptualize doing something else with a co-writer, but you know, you're so busy. How do you balance, you know, being, uh, being Josh Walker with JT Ellison? Cause you're already writing a book a year as Ellison. Right. Um, I've never been really good at doing just one thing at a time. I write one book at a time, but I'm really good at segmenting. Okay. This is my work for this. This is my work for this. And, and, and doing it like that. So, you know, 2018 is when we started this book, 2021 is when we released it. So it, it had quite a long journey sure. to, to fruition. And it was, you know, I would work on it for a month. You know, she, she, we would work on it. She would go back and write the manuscript, bring it back to me as a draft. I would go through it, bump it up a little bit in places, change a few things, give it back to her. She would work on it, give it back to me. And we, we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth for a good year. And it was like, okay, this is my weekend book. This is my fun time. This is my palate cleanser. Um, my work can be dark. And it was really refreshing to be able to step into the magical world and be like, okay, I get to conjure a spell to do X, you know, whatever, whatever it was. It's like, oh, I'm going to ward this room. Oh, how fun is that? I believe in magic. I wish I had the ability to, to do it, but I think it's all around us. I mean, you just look at a tree, look at the ocean, look at the sky. I mean, magic is around us. Some people can access it. Yeah, that's a very Greek conception, of course, of magic in the natural world. You know, the Greeks endowed everything with a god or a goddess or an mm -hmm. infant riot or whatever it might have been. So every, you know, every stream, every tree, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, I think um, they were very much in touch with the natural world. And they allowed their gods and goddesses to behave badly, um, which yeah. they often did, um, and promiscuously, and sometimes exerted their powers and, you know, um, in bad ways as well as good ways. I mean, there's a lot of heroes, but there also are, are some, some villains, um, but not all the time. And even Norse mythology really kind of mixes it up, you know, with, um, with the gods doing good. I mean, you have Loki the trickster, but then, mm -hmm. you know, and Thor the thunder god, and, but it's interesting. And the roles of women, I think, are, um, the Greek women stand on a more equal footing I think if you if you really know your Greek mythology and so forth, you have a goddess like Diana or like yep. um, you know um, Athena, and you know they're just as powerful in their own right most of the time. But then you have Juno married to Jupiter or Hera married to um, I'm trying to remember Zeus, Zeus. Um, and and that still is a more I mean she has power, but he has more power. So, you know, but most of the gods aren't married. Um, there are some couples that are, but a lot of them are not. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really long tradition. It's an Arthurian tradition, too, where, you know, you have people fighting in the real world, but then you have, um, you know, a certain amount of magic going on. So do you find that, um, I mean, this must end up being your combined voice, but do you find that you have, you changed your voice to write with Alicia as Josh Walker compared to your thriller voice as J.T. Ellison? 
it's a, it is a different voice. It is definitely a different voice. It's um, it's lighter. It's funnier. She has just Alicia is just quick, and and Jane is very quick. And it, there's just I you know there's definitely I can read and see things that I would never have said that she said. But now she's merging into me, which is really interesting. So when we did the final revisions, now there are large parts that I I have no idea who wrote what. It's like, did, my mom was asking me, did you write that? I'm like, I don't remember. <laughs> I, maybe, I don't know. It's, it's been a really fun collaboration because, you know, working with Catherine, Catherine and I have gotten to be friends. We didn't know each other beforehand. Alicia and I already were friends. So, so that was an, a different interpersonal relationship. Catherine and I are dear, dear close friends. We talk every day. I mean, that's, but when I met her, I didn't know her. Right. And, you know, we had to, we had to find our footing together, whereas Alicia and I already had that and, and it was, it was just a little more seamless coming into it. And I knew exactly what I wanted from her and, and she delivered and in spades, you know, she, she just did an absolutely amazing job. She wanted to be here. She's teaching. She, that's, no, she's you, off you tell teaching me. a private class today. Yeah, I'm sorry. She's not. It's interesting that you've assumed the Catherine role in your relationship with Alicia having, you know, and so obviously you learned, pardon me, I just dropped my cheat sheet. <laughs> you obviously I, learned. Um, I did learn. And, and it was part you know, of what I wanted to do. I really wanted, Catherine opened a lot of doors for me. She gave me an amazing a set of opportunities with new publishers, with being, you know, such a huge brand and a huge bestseller. And I felt like she, you know, mentored me in so many ways. And I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to reach down the ladder and pull somebody up the way she did with me. I think that's really important, especially for female writers to support each other and, and help each other wherever we can. And it just, that was, that's how this started. It was like, wow, look at what she's done for me. Look at how she's opened my eyes to how so many things in publishing work and how writing works and how readerships are. Maybe I can do this for somebody else. And well, that's, I you think know, it's, yeah, but that's my wonderful goal. Too. Um, yeah. Um, and so you've chosen to what, to publish in a somewhat unconventional way? Yes, this is an unconventional way. So it's under my Two Tales Press imprint, where I've been doing mostly short stories. Um, I've done two anthologies. I built the press planning to publish two of my own books, one being Field of Graves, which is the Taylor Jackson pre prequel, and the other, which was my standalone. No One Knows was not selling in New York. Nobody wanted it. I was like, fine, I'll do it myself. And just before that happened, Simon and Schuster and Gallery came in and said, no, 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 we'd like to do this. And they did a wonderful job. And that was, that was great. So I had built a press and I didn't have a book to publish. So I thought, all right, I'll do Field of Graves. And then Mira came in and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> so I've had a long history of being about to publish a book of my own and having people slip in and take it which is I would much rather somebody else do all the heavy lifting. Um, but for this one, I kind of knew I was up. We did take it out. We didn't get the kind of interest that we wanted. New York doesn't like urban fantasy very much, especially light urban fantasy. This just doesn't fit the mold of what they were looking for. They wanted witches. She's a magician, which, you know, it just wasn't exactly right for them. And so I said, nope, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. It's going to be great. Um, we have sold the audio rights traditionally and, you know, we're working on subsidiary rights and everything. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a nice hefty book. Yes, it I'm, is. Now I've got mine right. You know, now. You're right. It's, uh, I, you, you know, can see, you can see the, um, yeah, it's, the size of it. It's, it's got a very nice uh, dust jacket. There's kind of a cool, I match, I dress to match the cool green on the dust jacket. Also, because yeah. part of this book takes place in Ireland. I mean, uh, Jane has always wanted to, to actually see rather than a scan the book of Leinster. And so yes. Trinity College in Dublin is the place that she's long wanted to go. And in fact, the hook that gets her to finally agree reluctantly to join the CIA is that she will have access to every book, manuscript, whatever that exists in the world. So, I mean, if, she, if she'd been, um, 
couple of millennia earlier, she would have been at the library in Alexandria, which right. actually offered um, free accommodation and so forth to scholars. And they're working now on, on recreating it. And if you don't know this, you can, you can go to the Library of Alexandria, the Great Library of Alexandria website, and you can sign up um, and create your own library shelf there. Dana Stab and I, and I visited the library and we were just entranced. Um, and we were planning to go back, but they're in their way trying to recreate that original concept um, by, through digitizing. Um, because, you know, most of the library was lost in, in the, I'm trying to remember whether it was the explosion in Pompeii or what, whatever it was that wiped out, I think it was Pompeii, wiped out the library and, you know, the, the, it was mostly scrolls and who knows, they're probably going to like the Dead Sea Scrolls and with this new, um, you know, imaging technology, they've been, they're able to read some scrolls that have been Damage seriously burned or whatever it is. So we may find more of the Library of Alexandria's contents. I mean, how cool would that be to find an unknown play by Aeschylus, for example, or right. you know, more writings by Plato or somebody we've never heard of who might turn out to be brilliant. But anyway, yeah. I can really understand the pull for Jane. You know that I mean, as a as a librarian and a serious biblio nerd. The prospect of being able to access, you know, all of the printed material in the world would have just, you know. Right. I mean, that's, how would she, she can't say no to that. That is the <laughs> ultimate carrot. And, and she's, you know, she's, as long as there's pie, she's there. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. So since you started this with your own press, are you envisioning this? To, I'm assuming because it says book one, always a clue, that you're planning on writing at least three because a trilogy appears to be kind of the normal, um, the normal structure for a fantasy series. And then if it really does well, you can go on. But most of the time people commit to three books. What's your plan? Six. Six. Oh, there we are. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's... It's one of those, each book in its elemental magic. So each book represents an element. Oh. So that's, that's part of, of the plan is, is the elemental magic and what Jane is doing and where the series is going and the things that need to happen. Um, so that's, you know, fingers crossed, we can, we can pull that off and make that, make that work. But it's one of those, I mean, it, I could go on with it forever. It's it's a series that would just continually regenerate itself. Yeah, with, well, I think it's a brilliant concept. There's more than six libraries in the world, right? I mean, yeah. there's just so many things that can be done with it. Well, and since you're it's your own publishing company, you're the master of your own fate. You sure. know, I mean, economics will eventually play some sort of a role, but you know, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, my husband and I had a, a press of our own for 20 years, which we eventually sold uh, in 2019, in part because we're so old that, you know, we, it's, we couldn't envision going on forever. And we had a responsibility to our authors. And also because it really is hard for a very small publishing company to publish a lot of authors and, yeah. and get any traction for them. But your case is different. I mean, you, you're doing just one thing. And so with that focus, you should be able to, you know, you could, you can make it a labor of love, but you could also probably at least break even, which I have to tell you truthfully is mostly the goal with small publishing. It's just, you know, not to lose a lot and to, to love right. the whole thing along the way. If it becomes so expensive that, you know, supporting it becomes unrealistic, there you are. But and up I've, until that point, you're fine. Yeah. I've made I've made some mistakes with the press in the past, and I've learned from them. And you know, this uh, there are just ways you have to do it to to maintain a tiny little margin of of profit, or else, yeah, the whole thing goes up in smoke and it doesn't work. But you know, doing it is a labor of love, and it's taken a lot of time. Um, I'm I'm. I like doing it. It's really fun to know the entire process. And then there are the walls that you can't break down. Like you can't get into Idlevice. So it's very hard to get into libraries when you're a self-published author. It's very hard to take an indie press, even, even to indie bookstores. But you know, thankfully I've got wonderful relationships with you and Murder by the Book and, and Parnassus and other places that are willing to take a chance and stock the books. and. You know, I, I've learned as much as I can about how to 
publish well, to publish well with my partners and, you know, not just my co-writer, but my business partners and with luck, you know, we'll be able to, to break down some of those walls. But you have an ally that um, we didn't have 20 years ago when we started, which is social media. Um, yeah. You know, you have channels for for selling books, including TikTok, which I am personally not going to learn, but which I <laughs> Me neither. No way. <laughs> it's becoming a, a book thing. Um, but, you know, I do Instagram for the store and we have another person who does Twitter, another person who does Facebook with Anna mm -hmm. and a wonderful customer who does um, Pinterest. And, you know, there's a limit, I think, to how far you can go with all this. And then you wind up spending all your time, you know, being cute and envied on Instagram. But does it actually contribute to your bottom line? Um, probably that's not a, that much. That's a good question. But, well, you know, it's not, it's, you can't really quantify it. I mean, I think you're forced to have all these tools. But I never know. I had this discussion with Riley Sager the other day because we oversold the order that we shipped to him. And I thought, you know, wonder what happened here because we, we hadn't even gotten to, to really doing a big promo for it. And we got a whole cluster of orders all in one day, which usually tells you something. So I realized that he had taken a, a photo and posted it to Instagram of him signing all of our books, you know, 100 books or whatever he was sitting there surrounded by. And apparently, I'm just guessing, that that was enough to push some people into it because they could see it was actually, you know, signing. Physically them. signing, yep. Right, so I wrote to him and I said, you know, if it's okay, we're gonna need to ship you more books. And by the way, I said, did you do anything? And he said, well, I guess it might've been the Instagram post. Now I'm not saying that that was what happened and there's really no way to know, but generally if you get um, a surprising surge, you know, you can, you can tie it to something. So as long as you keep your, your inventory manageable, you know, you don't, you don't overprint and you don't wind up warehousing books in the whole bit, you've got a lot of channels that were not available really until the last 10 years, maybe even six, where books really have taken some huge pushes. I mean, you know, we have this monster cam campaign coming up for Outlander number nine, because I mean, we're in a fantasy <laughs> world all the time. And, um, and, you know, it's almost impossible to measure the effect of Diana's social media. Um, if she retweets anything, it's just, you know, we, it's astonishing. Yeah. Um, and so you already have a platform as JT Allison which allows you, I think, you know, if you were, if you were actually Josh Walker, heretofore unknown author, during the platform, it would be really hard to even make a splash on social media. But since you already have a name and a platform, then that allows you, and Alicia does as well. Yes. That allows both of you to combine, you know, um, and create. And then, you know, then really, it's sort of like throwing a, a stone into a pond. You know, the ripples go out there. I mean, we don't have, we don't have a marketing department. We've never done a paid ad. I mean, you know, we're, we're 31 years in and booming along and we do no marketing. We have no advertising. And, and it's so interesting to, to all of us, you know, we always wonder we, what, what ripple did we, you know, what's going on? Relationship management. I you have know. relationships. You well, actually love the books and love the authors and that spreads and everybody knows, oh my gosh, you need to, I, I, that's the very first, you're the very first store that anybody ever told me I needed to go to when I was a debut. They're like, did you go to Poison Pen? I'm like, what's Poison Pen? You know, I'm like, this is, I, I don't live in the area. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in a completely different part of the country. I don't know anything about crime fiction. This was, gosh, back in what, 2003, 2004? I mean, you know, and the second you got on my radar, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. And now, of course, I've been to the store and I've done sightings and we've done events and, and you know, we talk all the time now, which is wonderful. It's relationship management. It's how you reach out to the world and how the authors respect you for what you do. I think that's a very kind way of putting it. And, and I'm sure you're right, because that comes back to what I was saying, that the author's social media has a lot more to do with our sales than what we do. I mean, we're there, you know, we're the, we're the base, we're the delivery system, and we have 
a fairly robust social media, but really the big the big things are driven by forces you know other than us, which is which is like your magic world. I mean, if you really think about it, you know, Jane's only going to be able to manage a bit, and the the magic world is going to be like that. It's going to have things going on um, that she's not going to be able to control, and which will have ripples, and which will bring you know other things into it. So you mentioned that we've been talking, and one of the things we've been talking about a lot with Jane Ann Prince, who's a wonderful third leg to this whole discussion, <laughs> is, about, is about the gothic novel and, and how it has suddenly become a buzzword. It's a buzz reviewer word. Um, and what does it actually mean? Um, JT and Jane and I, Ann and I did an earlier book chat, which you can find, um, I'll check to make sure it's there on our Facebook page about the gothic and now we could do a whole new one because since we did that we found even more what was it yesterday the eco gothic thriller the eco the, yeah the eco gothic so right. you know it, it's it's amazing how this is exploding it's well, really yes. and it is becoming because i don't know that that book that we were talking about really was a gothic uh, that didn't feel like a gothic to me. Well, again. no, I agree with you. But, you know, my point was that a reviewer hauled in the word gothic, you know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a shorthand for various elements rather than trying to define them. It's like grappling with what's the difference between psychological suspense and domestic suspense. And, you know, are they really <laughs> any different? And what are the elements that create both? And I, I did a, the book lunch for Claire McIntosh on Monday, and she has combined the airplane thriller with domestic suspense. So it's not a classic thriller, but but the airplane part of it, it's almost Agatha Christie because you know everybody's in yes. the airplane, <laughs> which is like like a country house, you know, or or that kind of contained space that we think of as having a gothic. It's like Manderley on fire. There's the airplane you know, up there over the, uh, no, it's on its way from London to Sydney, a 20 hour flight. So it's somewhere over probably China or something when all this is going on. And yet, and yet the drama um, of the, the woman on the plane and her policeman husband back home is a domestic suspense drama. So it's a really interesting combination, but I wouldn't call it a gothic, you know, just because it has a contained space or because it has Right. psychology in it and so forth. So basically, it's a thriller if you take a really broad definition of, of thriller. But I, I like the fact that Claire experimented, you know, by combining these two things into one really interesting book. Now, you can, there's a book called Falling that's coming out very shortly by another. Uh, it's another airplane disaster book written by um, a flight attendant. And it really is a thriller. I mean, it's a pure thriller from start to finish. It doesn't have um, the domestic drama of, you know, who's unreliable and is the husband cheating and all that stuff. It's, it's not in there. And what's interesting to me, Shay, I talked to the agent of, for it last night, falling, tends to call me at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. We have book talks. Um, <laughs> but, but I said, basically, falling is really a blockbuster movie. I mean, you know, from beginning to end, it's sort of like Die Hard, you know, Repriest, um, although the, the flight attendant has a special skill set. It's not like, you know, Bruce Willis in the building in Los Angeles with no particular skill set. Whereas Hostage really isn't a movie. It would be much more difficult to make it a movie um, because it doesn't crescendo. I mean, it goes to a great, a great sort of a climax, but then it has several step backs as we, as we move towards the end. I, you don't do that in a thriller. You know, a thriller goes, shh, you know, kaboom. Um, and I, I found that really interesting to look at the structure of the two books, which have an almost identical concept and see how different they are, which case me to Lee Child, who, you know, whose motto is, you know, you can give three people one story and you'll get three different books. Completely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I really agree with that. Um, and so I think, you know, for you and for Alicia, uh, Tomb of the Queen, you know, is your own is your own version of of magic fantasy world in the same way that Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell was, you know, um, a, an interesting version of it. I'm really pissed they never did the second TV. You know, they they did Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell on TV, and it was great. And then they stopped like halfway through, and it's never it never come back to do the other half, which I find truly annoying. <laughs> 
wasn't, it wasn't the pandemic. You know people, you know that you know people that could fix that for you. I don't know people <laughs> on television, you know, what can I say? It's just a shame because because yeah. to leave that book without its ending for people who are never going to read it, because mm -hmm. there are people who, you know, will talk about a book as though they read it, but the truth is it's only the movie. I mean, I once did a poll of how many people had actually read The Maltese Falcon as compared to, you know, watching the movie, they, they have. it was a fairly small percentage of the group that had really ever read the book. And, and that might be true of Rebecca too. You know, more people may know the two movie versions than, you know, will ever that's have true. a book. I wonder if the that's part of what's driving this new Gothic is the movie, you know, there was so much attention around the movie and everybody got excited about it. And maybe they went and read the book Maybe. I'm talking about why writers are suddenly writing so yeah. many more gothic novels. I mean, it, it really, I wonder if that resurgence has anything to do with the Hollywood factor. It certainly might. And also I think it's, uh, and we talked about this before, I think it's kind of an inevitable extension of the trust no one. I really do because, you know, I mean, if you think about Rebecca, you know, who, who was trustworthy? Was it Mrs. Danvers? Was it the dead Rebecca? Is it Mr. DeWinter? She is stuck in a trust no one trio, essentially. Right. Even one of them is dead. Um, and well, and, and there are more people besides, you know, there's some peripheral people. So she never knows who to trust all the way through the book. Um, and so, you know, I think that the trust no one genre kind of pushes you in that direction of a, of a gothic. It's, it, but you have, to start, you have to combine it with, with that enclosed world. You know, a, a gothic really almost <laughs> always takes place in some kind of a, of a closed environment. It doesn't have to be a chateau or a country house or, you know, it can be, as we just said, it can be an airplane. Um, so it's interesting to me when people throw around the word gothic, I never can tell whether it's just because it's dark um, or because, you know, the danger is kind of inchoate. And, you know, mm -hmm. if it's not a, if it's not like a guy pointing a gun on you, you know, does Gothic, if it's, if it's danger, but you're sensing it, but it's not right in front of you, is that what inspires the word Gothic? I just don't know. I don't know either. I mean, for, I know what it is for me, but, and right now I think it's a marketing buzzword. I, I think that that's it's become just an ex exciting way to say that this is dark and creepy. Um, and, and it needs to be dark and creepy. I mean, a, a spy thriller is, is trust no one, right? Yeah. So that's, that's essentially, you can't, you can't have a gothic spy thriller. I don't think, well, I don't think that would one. work, right? Come on, JT, we're going to see one. You know we are. Well, now I've got to go write one. Now, right. now that I've got this challenge. <laughs> I think you're right. I think dark and creepy and creepy embraces unexplained, you know, so I mean, uh, but you're right there. And there's, there's going to be some sort of nuance maybe of supernatural. Um, and the that, setting, the yeah. setting is huge. The setting is so important to that. I mean, it's, you have to have the setting as a character for it to really be a gothic. Right. I and, and also I think, you know, thinking about this in a thriller, you almost always know from the get-go who the antagonist is. I mean, a thriller yeah. absolutely has to have a protagonist and an antagonist. But in a gothic, maybe, maybe you don't, you know, you're not sure who the antagonist is. Think back to Mary Stewart. She always had two men, right? She always had a heroine in some kind of jeopardy, whether it was the Chateau in France or, you know, the Mediterranean island or wherever she happened to be um, in one of her books. I love her books. But that was her design. She always had like two guys and the heroine could never work out which one of them was going to be the antagonist, you know, which one was going to be untrustworthy. And you had to read all the way to the end. Actually, Elizabeth Peters, The Crocodile on the Sandbank, that is the question if you, you know, that's the one series that if you don't read the first book, you will never be able to read the first book with any sense of surprise, right? Because, you know, we never, she doesn't know whether Emerson is going to be the good guy or the bad right. guy, you see, right. And then she introduces Emerson's brother down the road as, you know, the more visible bad guy. And then even he becomes kind of questionable towards the end of the series. So, you know, I don't, I don't, a gothic thriller is a really tough call 
because you know if you need a plain sight antagonist and yet if it's gothic you, you don't want to know necessarily who it is although you can have you know i suppose you can have like a devil or somebody from the outset i don't know it's fascinating isn't it how we think it, about it all is. this stuff it is i mean that's that's what i did in her dark lies i mean i've got a first person protagonist right who is unnamed but is the villain i mean is clearly the villain yeah you know, and then, but again, in the Gothic, you're also fighting against that supernatural element. You're fighting right. against the setting. Everything cons is conspiring against you to, to, you know, hold you back from discovering the truth. And so it's, it's also an, el there's an element of, of self masking through that as well, that you don't reveal your own secrets and you have to find your way through that path as well. Because you were, the protagonist always has some secret in a good in a good gothic novel, there is you know some sort of twist at the end that the the protagonist has been holding back, and that's how they got themselves there in the first place. That's a really interesting point. Although I don't know that Mrs. De Winter did she? I don't remember Mrs. De Winter had any kind of a held back secret. I think she was just naive from the get go. But maybe I'm not remembering it as clearly as I should. No, no, I don't disagree with that, but I think she wanted so much more and she couldn't admit that. Well, I that's, mean, to, yeah. to run off with a man you meet, you know, you're, you're, you're a companion to a woman and then, it, you know, you meet some guy at, at breakfast and the next thing you know, you're married to him and he's the most eligible bachelor. I mean, to, she's the ingenue, right? That's the, yeah. that's the character, but there's, there's darkness in her like calls to like there's a darkness in him there's a darkness in her that she doesn't have a name right so she's she's really this nameless person who goes into this story and and is meant to be the innocent but she absolutely she's running from something to jump so quickly into a marriage with a man she doesn't know and get herself into you know warned oh, again yeah she's running from from basically a powerless pointless existence existing as a companion to a demanding older person and figure into a that, powerless pointless existence yeah, being well, the second wife to a rich man <laughs> right and you know i guess you have to applaud her courage for making the jump even you know even mm -hmm. if it wasn't um even if it turns out to be unwise and perilous and i i think your book her dark lies is your your rebecca you know, you create sure. you create the island which becomes Manderley, and you've got the same characters going on. And and you know, it's a it's a book that's a lot of fun to play with. I mean, there are many people who have written you know some version of Rebecca, um, and so I I mean, it's a classic. And I I'm always amazed when I find people who haven't read it or or have never heard of it who are interested in the crime or the fantasy genre because you know it's just a seminal book. Um, and I'm always surprised when I find people that, you know, really don't know about, you know, the murder of Roger Ackroyd, the original, un well, not the original, but certainly one of the most powerful, unreliable narrators ever. And it's not, you know, it's not like Paula Hawkins or, or Gillian Flynn suddenly came up with, you know, an original idea and the unreliable no. narrator, it was no. already there. They've used it to great effect, but I mean, he was already on the table. Um, and then there were none, you know, that structure, which is a, is indeed a Gothic structure, you know, that was already on the table with Christie. So it's, um, it's hard to imagine the present world without her, you know, I mean, it's easy to look back and say, oh, it was Agatha Christie, but she was breaking new ground, you know, in, in sure. all kinds of ways and even had her own Gothic adventure, which, you know, has been analyzed and and theatricalized and portrayed, and no one will ever really know whether she had a genuine, you know, um, breakdown, whether she had a dissociative moment, whether she went off to punish Archie, whether she just went to hide because she was embarrassed because divorce was so terrible, you know, it, for her, for a middle-class woman in the 1920s and a mother, that was like almost the worst social disaster that could happen to you. Plus having an unfaithful husband would be truly traumatic so you know especially one you love yeah no, you know the one you married nobody wanted you to marry him and yeah. he turns out to be a cad and everybody else was right I mean yeah I'd run away too yep. just to get a grip on oh my gosh my world is falling apart what am I gonna do 
That's right. So, you know, she, she experienced that. And I often wonder if that, you know, was a plot engine for her in a way, you know, that because she'd been through it herself, it, it you know, she writing as therapy. Um, and she was sure. a relentless writer. I mean, she never stopped writing, you know, right up until the end of her life. Maybe, maybe a lot of her work, you know, was basically her therapy. I mean, she's a really interesting person. It could also just be, we could all be off the mark, right? She could just be devious and wanted to see what would happen if a famous person disappeared from their yeah. life so she could track it and use it as research. <laughs> you That's know? absolutely true. I agree with you. I mean, there are so many plausible explanations, yeah. you know, and we'll never know because she never revealed it. You know, she, she, she took whatever it was that inspired that whole thing with her to the grave. So we are never going to know. Um, she was an intensely private person. When she was president of the detection club, she agreed to do it as long as she never had to speak. So, um, you know, she, she wasn't, um, everything in her came out in her books, as far yeah. as I can tell, you know, fascinating. I was lucky enough to, to visit Greenways with her, because I belonged to the Crime Writers Association. And, um, and we had a meeting when Rosalind, her daughter was still alive, but fairly elderly. And, uh, and Greenways is a fascinating house, um, cluttered and dusty and full of decades of memorabilia, a GI painted mural on the wall when it was given over to the US Army during World War II, you know, um, and, and I often wondered with all the things lying around and whatever, if it was kind of like a memory box for her. I mean, and yeah, boom. I know, now but I've we been have, there. Now we yeah. have the next Gothic right there. Yeah, I mean, somebody, sitting, I can, I'm sitting here seeing this going, oh my gosh, there's a lot that could be done with that story. <laughs> yeah, I'm a great generator of story ideas. I'm not a writer, but you know, I'm, I'm terrific at concept. <laughs> just yeah, we may need to talk about this further because I just finished up. the book and I'm looking for what I'm going to do next. So I love hmm. it. So, all right, so you've answered all these questions, you know, what's next in store? So I guess the final question, let me ask you, um, since you've said that you're thinking of six, where is the next locus of, um, for Jane in book two uh, of Jane Thorne, CIA librarian? Well, she's going to be in Paris. Ooh, okay. She's going to be in Paris, which should be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, there's some, the, the setup that we have for the different, uh, libraries that she goes to are, are it's really fun and and I'm hopeful that we can make that all happen because it looks it just will be so much fun to do it's a one book a year kind of thing which you know it, again Alicia has her career I've got my career and this is something that we're doing for fun on the side but it's I have a feeling it might take on a life of its own because I think it's a a lot of fun and you know, great cover, great art. Our artist, Kim Killian, really, really yeah. nailed it. And I think that helps in this environment. And it's a, it's a fun story. You know, it's a really fun story. It is a fun story. I'm anxious to finish reading it. Um, and I thank you for sending me a copy because it's great. I will in turn send around and send you a bunch of books. I just need to figure out where to slot it in in one of our book clubs because I have to work a month or two ahead. But in any case, for those of you who are watching this, we will at some point soon have autographed copies of Tomb of the Queen from, uh, from JT and Alicia, she happens to be around and we'll feature it in some way because I think it really is a lot of fun. And um, we're still all, you know, even if we're emerging somewhat from the pandemic, there's a lot of unknowns yeah. ahead. And so escape reading is, um, is still a great way to kind of duck out of everyday cares and it's also a great way to travel when you know you may not be comfortable or given what the travel industry is doing to everybody may not be able to afford the absolutely pirate my husband is still blown away by the car rental fee that we are incurring um over the fourth and he said to me wow you know um and and i think it's going to be quite a while before all of that settles down so people who want to travel are willing to pay these outstanding premiums for hotels and other stuff, but that's not going to be sustainable. So no. for those for those who feel like it's either too scary or just too damned expensive, um, books are still your best passport to going wherever you want. See how it works out. So thanks for your time. It was great. Is there anything else you'd like to say? 
No, I just want to say thanks. It's always such a joy talking to you. Well, I've really enjoyed it too. It's a real pleasure. So we'll be in touch soon. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.